What's up, guys? Welcome to... <laughs> Why is this so hard? I don't know what to say. Okay. What's up, guys? My name is Dove. Welcome to my channel. This is only my second YouTube video ever, and if you were here for the first one, you will see that we have a huge system upgrade, okay? I got a camera. I got a new microphone, or rather, I got a microphone, um, and we're no longer recording in photo booth on my MacBook. So, huge upgrade. Really excited to dive into our topic today because I am going to be talking about children's literature and how important I think it is. Specifically, we're going to be looking at Holes because I think Holes is the perfect example of everything that high quality, complex children's literature should be. Um, I'm really excited to be making this video. I'm This is something that I'm super passionate about. I also uh, wore my Very Hungry Caterpillar Eat the Rich t-shirt for the occasion. <laughs> So the way this is gonna go, we're going to dive into what makes children's literature high quality to begin with, and then go into why Holes is a great example of this. I'm also going to be referencing this book, which I picked up a couple years ago. It's called Wild Things, The Joy of Reading Children's Literature as an Adult by Bruce Handy. So buckle in, I think we're in for a good time. So during the height of the pandemic, I like, I'm sure many, many other people kind of went searching for anything that we thought would bring us comfort. I don't know about you guys, but I reconsumed a lot of the media that I really loved as a child, both from like TV shows that I enjoyed. I watched a lot of Phineas and Ferb, to be honest with you. Um, I reread a bunch of different books from different parts of my life so all the way back to like children's books as well as um you know some more middle grade books which is why we're diving into holes but i also reread two like young adult series that i think are intended for older children one of them was twilight don't get me wrong, I love Twilight, okay? I'm a big Twilight fan. However, if you are also a Twilight fan, you know that the biggest fans are also the ones who hate it the most and love to rip it to shreds. I love it. It's terrible, right? But revisiting The Hunger Games, oh my goodness, it was so much better than I even realized when I loved it the first go around. Um, like, I got so much more out of it as an adult and was really able to appreciate the genius of Suzanne Collins' writing and storytelling and all of the very complex ideas that she was able to put into the story intended for teenagers. Um, and that is actually, that experience is what led me to buy this book, which just led me down a deeper rabbit hole of rediscovering children's literature that I enjoyed as a child. By the time I hit high school, I basically wasn't reading like any young adult or middle grade at all anymore. I had already fully entrenched myself into like adult literary fiction, which is also a wonderful genre that I learned a lot from. But I think I really missed out on some of the wonderful, valuable aspects of media that is intended for children. Because I am a big believer, or rather, there's nothing to be believed about it, but children are an oppressed class of people. There is this like want to protect your children from the horrors of the world. And I think that does have a time and a place. I don't think kids need to be subjected to just how awful everything is in very like expressive terms and the way that adults can take that in as if you know adults also have a toll from ex experiencing the word the world through that lens but I feel like people have taken this too far of they're trying to protect children to the point of denying them their own lived experiences because children despite being children do in fact experience the horrors of the world just like adults do kids experience war and genocide and death and trauma just like the rest of us do and to deny stories intended for them at levels that they can understand that tackle these very real things that they may well be experiencing is doing a disservice to an entire group of people who are going to become adults one day their stories deserve to be told in ways that make sense to them I think there's also this natural follow-up of people kind of not taking children's media seriously from a literary perspective, from a critical lens. And it's only been within the past maybe 15, 20 years that we've started to see that idea shift. And, you know, critics are really valuing the content of children's media. Again, 
it, it's not like it hasn't happened in the past, okay? Obviously, we have the Newberry Award. Like, there are bodies of people specifically who go out and are, like, entrenched in the world of children's media and take it seriously. But that's really only been happening in small groups of people. And I think the wider public consciousness, there is something that they're missing out on. So in the foreword of his book, The Joy of Reading Children's Literature as an Adult, Bruce Handy writes, It should go without saying that the best children's literature is every bit as rich and rewarding in its concerns, as honest and stylish in execution, as the best adult literature, and also as complicated, stubborn, conflicted, and mysterious. Like any worthwhile art, great children's books are capable of speaking in many different ways to many different readers. A novelist and critic, Alison Lurie, says that the most perceptive kids' authors have the ability to look at the world from below and note its less respectable aspects, just as little children playing on the floor can see the chewing gum stuck to the underside of the polished mahogany tables and the hems of silk dresses held up with safety pins. The fact of the matter is, children do have a different perspective on the world, and I think as adults, we are so self-absorbed, like, obsessed with this idea that we have the truly hard life, okay, we're the ones in control, we know everything, we are better, that we tend to undervalue this perspective that children can bring. And the fact that as much as they are not experts in the world of adults, we are no longer experts in the world of children. And just as we have to teach children what it's like to live in our world, I think a lot can be gained from listening to children about what it's like to live in theirs. Jesus said to the people around him, please let the little children come up here. I want to learn from them. He may not have said those words, but I think that's what he meant. Now, this is not to say that every single children's book out there is profound and wonderful and worth a read. In fact, I would say the opposite is true. Many of them aren't. And it's really only been, again, within the past, honestly, okay, this one has been longer, maybe like 50, 60, 70 years that we have taken that turn towards the better. The first American children's book was published in 1690, and it included uh, hits such as <laughs> this, this poem, Love God. Use no ill words. Fear God. Tell no lies. Serve God. Hate lies. Cheat not in your play. Strive to learn. Play not with bad boys. And be not a dunce. You know, some of, some of that, there is something to take. I do think be not a dunce is a pretty good piece of advice. Also, be fair in your play. Pretty good piece of advice. But like, hate lies? I mean, also, I guess pretty, but this is not engaging literature. This is just a list, list of prescribed rules that, frankly, kids are already hearing on repeat from their parents and other adults in their lives and have already learned to tune out. That type of book is not engaging or interesting. And I'll talk about this more later, but I think actually some of the best children's media is the ones that aren't trying to stick a moral down your throat. There is a moral to be gained. There is a point to the story being told, but being so forthright with like trying to prescribe ideas onto kids is not the thing to get them to listen. And in fact, this kind of lowbrow children's literature that was the kind of only thing being published for many, many years is what led a lot of our beloved children's authors to begin writing in the first place. Beverly Cleary, who is a personal hometown hero to me, her tiny Oregon hometown is just right down the road from my teeny tiny Oregon hometown. She was also a longtime resident of Portland and all of her uh, children's books are set off of Klickitat Street up in North... Uh, North Portland, but she literally started her career because of her disgust towards other children's books. Again, Bruce Handy writes that her career was to some extent fueled by her peak at insipid children's books, the kind that treats kids as if they were mush-headed or shallow, rather than just young. In her memoir, My Own Two Feet, Beverly Cleary wrote, One morning, during a lull, I picked up an easy reading book and read, Bow wow, I like the green grass, said the puppy. How ridiculous, I thought. No puppy I had known talked like that. 
As I'm recording this, the sun is shifting, and although I have like an artificial light, I'm trying not to get the glare on my glasses, but it's coming in through my window, and I have like these little rainbow things. So that's why uh, my face is all rainbowy, <laughs> but I think it's fun. I've talked a lot about how valuable high quality and complex children's literature is, but I think before we can dive into our case study, we need to define what actually makes a kid's book complex. What makes it high quality? What gives it these these aspects that make it worth revisiting, that make it so valuable to the children reading for the first time? So I've come up with a list of four things that I think are necessary to making a high quality, engaging, emotionally complex children's book. So the first thing that high quality children's literature should include is a timeless theme and emotional center. Uh, Children's author Catherine Rundell wrote for a BBC article, When I write, I write for two people, myself, age 12, and myself, now, and the book must satisfy two distinct but connected appetites. My 12-year-old self wanted autonomy, peril, justice, food, and above all, a kind of destiny of atmosphere into which I could step and be engulfed. My adult self wants all those things, and also, acknowledgments of fear, love, failure, of the wrath that lives within the human heart. So what I try for when I write, failing often but trying, is to put down in as few words as I can the things that I most urgently and desperately want children to know and adults to remember. Those who write for children are trying to arm them for the life ahead with everything we can find that is true. And perhaps, also, secretly, to arm adults against those necessary compromises and necessary heartbreaks that life involves, to remind them that there always will be great, sustaining truths to which we can return. As adults, we might not be able to relate necessarily to the specific context of the story, but the things that the characters are feeling in those contexts should be able to translate to adult readers as well. I'm going to talk about it later, but in Holes, there is a teacher who kind of bullies Stanley in a way that's really unkind, and he feels embarrassed, okay? The teacher wasn't meaning this maliciously, but it came out that way, and ultimately, he still feels embarrassed. Embarrassment is something that we all encounter in all stages of our lives. It doesn't end with childhood. It, it doesn't begin in adulthood. So things like that where we can take that feeling and express it across multiple different contexts, I think is a really important aspect to making this thing relatable. So the second thing is that Again, even though the experiences within the book are not necessarily going to translate to the adults who are reading alongside these children, but I think the book needs to take its audience seriously and engage in those situations with good faith. Just because they may seem trivial as adults, like the, the specific situations don't seem like they necessarily carry the highest stakes. You know, again, thinking about like Ramona the Pest, you know, some of the situations that she gets herself into really aren't that serious, but they are taken seriously through the lens of the book, just because as adults, we can look in that and say, it really isn't that much, that big of a deal in the grand scheme of things. When you think about children and what their world looks like day to day, that is a big deal for them. It is a big thing in their grand scheme, right? Up to that point, they haven't had the lived experiences and complex, you know, p political, social, socioeconomic problems that we as adults have to face and deal with. They may have, and many, many children have dealt with the consequences of those things, but they aren't necessarily able to control those situations. I think a lot of children's books are going to be on situations that kids are in that they have control over and they need to take that seriously. If you're going to be a children's author, you can't go into writing things from an adult perspective. You need to be consciously making an effort to give a good faith explanation of that experience from the child's perspective. But I think that people really do desire to be in touch with honesty, no matter what they say no matter what kind of bravado uh, precedes them. I think that they really want to be in touch with what they consider to be something honest that they can be related to. I think we all look for that. 
So children's author Natalie O'Hara says that people in publishing often talk about child-friendly books, which suggests something consoling, sweet, and kind of nostalgic. But that's a smokescreen, because those qualities attract parents and teachers more than children. Children like sweet and safe stories, but they also like dark, bleak, unsettling, or horrible stories. Children are like everyone else. They want stories that reflect the whole contradictory tangle of their lives. Being an adult talking to a child doesn't mean babbling sweet talk about happy bunnies. You can just be a human talking to another human. You can kind of say, this is something I've noticed about life. What do you think? So David Newell, who played Mr. McFeely, the mailman on Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood, reflected on this exact thing, saying that, I think a lot of people really didn't understand the program or it didn't appeal to them. I think maybe they thought it was a little sugar-coated, which it was not at all. Fred would take the toughest subjects and deal with them. Divorce, death over the years, we did adoptions, sibling rivalry, jealousy, love, and did them so sensitively. But I wonder if people saw a lot of that. A lot of it is very subtle and not dynamic at all. Now, talking about Mr. Rogers and his genius is, again, a whole different video. But Mr. Rogers himself talked about this idea that there is so much drama in the everyday lives of children. We don't necessarily need to make up these big, sprawling stories to express these ideas. Now, that's not to say there isn't value in that, but we'll get into it more. But his his whole philosophy was this idea that you can sink down to the child's level and you need to validate the experiences of that child. In fact, I'm going to insert a clip here. We deal with such things as, as the inner drama of childhood. We don't have to bop somebody over the head to make, him, to, to make drama on the screen. We deal with such things as getting a haircut or the feelings about brothers and sisters and a kind of anger that arises in simple family situations. So the next thing that a good children's book should have is very straightforward storytelling. This doesn't mean not complex storytelling. You can still express a lot of ideas, but you should be expressing them as clearly and plainly as possible. And as somebody who is a writer, I have to say that I have a special bit of respect for children's authors in the sense that so many of them are able to weave these incredibly complex narratives with as few words as possible. I really struggle with that, okay? And I have so much respect for how plainly these people can write and still get these big, poignant ideas across. I wish I could remember who said this, but I saw a random TikTok from some random person probably a couple years ago at this point, um, but they were talking about children's picture books and when you're writing them, how quickly you need to dive into the action. And the metaphor that they used is the rocket should be taking off on page two. I don't remember what book they were talking about, but it was a, a picture book about some kids or maybe bears or something going to space in a rocket ship. And the rocket takes off on page two out of a 38-page picture book. Children's stories should get to the heart of the issue at the beginning, okay? And I'm actually going to read from my childhood copy of Charlotte's Web because I think uh, this opener is a perfect example of that. Literally, opening line. Where's Papa going with that axe? said Fern to her mother as they were setting the table for breakfast. Out to the hog house, replied Mrs. Arable. Some pigs were born last night. I don't see why he needs an axe, continued Fern, who is only eight. Well, said her mother, one of the pigs is a runt. It's very small and weak, and it will never amount to anything. So your father has decided to do away with it. <laughs> Way to get to the point, Mrs. Arable. I think another good example of this getting straight to the point being very clear <laughs> is actually the opening line of Voyage of the Dawn Treader, uh, which I I love Eustace and I love uh, Eyebrow Kid. <laughs> but the opening line from that book is, there was a boy called Eustace Clarence Scrub, and he almost deserved it. That's an excellent opening line. Now, this last piece is what I would say truly defines the good, passable, average children's literature from the truly great stories. And that is that their authors don't shy away from topics or themes or ideas just because they are too adult or too heavy or dark or hard hitting. They simply approach them in ways that are age appropriate to the audience they're writing for. 
And I think a great example of this in a different medium is actually the show Avatar The Last Airbender, the original one, obviously, um, which is very clearly a children's show. It's a silly little cartoon. It also covers topics like war and genocide and generational trauma and losing parents and political situations that cause family to turn against their own children, which are all things that real children experience. Just because it's awful and terrible and you don't want to confront the idea that so many children experience these things, they do. And they deserve to have those experiences represented on the page in ways that they can understand. It's so important for children to get these experiences validated by outside sources. They need to know that they're not alone. And before I decided to make this video, I actually made a quick TikTok about it. And I had somebody in the comments talking about this exact thing, that they lost a parent when they were really young and having access to children's specific stories about grief and losing parents is literally what got them through. If they wouldn't have had access to that, they talked about the fact that they don't think they would have become the functioning adults that they are. They would have had to deal and grapple with all of that grief and trauma on their own, and it would have led to negative consequences and outcomes for them. And for the children that are lucky enough to not need these stories, it's still valuable because it teaches them things that they will inevitably have their friends deal with or that they will have to deal with in the future. Or say they're lucky and they never have to deal with any of these things, although grief is inevitable and you will always lose the people that you love eventually. Even ignoring that, having access to these stories teaches empathy. And my goodness, in the world we live in today, we could all do with some more empathy. In her essay called The Child and the Shadow, famed sci-fi author Ursula K. Le Guin writes, There is still, in this country, a deep puritanical distrust of fantasy, which comes out often among people truly and seriously concerned about the ethical education of children. Fantasy, to them, is escapism. They confuse fantasy with infantilism and pathological regression. They seem to think that shadows are something we could simply do away with if we only turn on enough electric lights. It's hard not to get entangled in the superficialities of the collective consciousness, so that you end up with the baddies and the goodies all over again. Or, writers are encouraged to merely capitalize on sensationalism, upsetting the child reader without themselves being really involved in the violence of the story, which is shameful. Or you get the problem books, the problem of drugs, of divorce, of race prejudice, of unmarried pregnancy, and so on, as if evil were a problem, something that can be solved, that has an answer, like a problem in fifth grade arithmetic. That is escapism, posing evil as a problem instead of what it is. All the pain and suffering and waste and loss and injustice we will meet in all our lives long and must face and cope with over and over and over and admit and live with in order to live human lives at all. The young creature does need protection and shelter, but it also needs truth. What he needs to grow up is reality, the wholeness which exceeds all our virtue and all our vice. He needs knowledge. He needs self-knowledge. He needs to see himself and the shadow he casts. That is something he can face, his own shadow, and he can learn to control it and be guided by it so that when he grows up into his strength and responsibility as an adult in society, he will be less inclined, perhaps, to either give up in despair or to deny what he sees when he must face the evil that is done in the world and the injustices and grief and suffering that we all must bear and the final shadow at the end of it all. And even though Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood is intended for very young children, younger than, you know, what we're talking about here, more preschool age, even he recognized the importance of not shying away from these bad, terrible things that happen in the world. In response to a parent who had sent him a letter of concern about, you know, how do I talk about these things with my child, he said that, if you've watched Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood, you probably know that our programs do not try to avoid anxiety-arousing situations. We have dealt with the beginnings of life, as well as with its end, and with many of the feelings in between. We do try, though, to keep anxiety within a child's manageable limits and then to deal with it. We talk about those feelings and, in simple ways, try to show models for coping with them. So now that we've defined what makes children's literature high quality, we can dive into the meat here, which is 
Holes is the epitome of that. This is what every single children's book should strive to. Not necessarily its topic, not its contents per se, but the ways that those ideas that I've just presented are executed in this story is literally like bar none, this is the best. Now, of course, that's just my own personal opinion and y'all are welcome to different ones. And in fact, if you have opinions on other books that you think are just as good or better, I would love to hear about them. So please tell me in the comments because I'm not positive that you're going to be able to top this one for me, but I would love for you to try genuinely. I want to hear about books that impacted you in the same way that Holes has impacted me. So if you haven't already read this book, seen the movie, you have no idea what it's about, I'm going to give you a quick primer. So Holes centers around a child named Stanley Yelnance, who is shipped off to basically an alternative to Juvie um, called Camp Green Lake. He has been accused of stealing a pair of shoes that he did not steal but were in his possession. That's enough to consider him guilty. He gets shipped off to this, you know, rehabilitation program. And when he gets to Camp Green Lake, he finds that this program, all it is, is kids digging holes. I mean, I guess you could guess that from the names. Every single day, they go out into this dried up desert landscape and dig holes because that's uh, supposedly gonna build character. This book covers a lot of very complex and adult themes such as class, homelessness, the prison industrial complex, racism and violence against women, generational trauma and immigrant stories, friendship, community, and fate, destiny, and choice. And considering the book comes in at only 233 pages with large font, I think the audiobook is like four and a half hours, that is a lot for such a story to cover, and yet it does every single one of those flawlessly. It covers different topics, different characters, it switches between stories in a way that isn't at all confusing or overdone. It feels very natural. It is so seamlessly woven that, honestly, again, I think some adult authors could take a note or two because I've read personally some books that are, you know, in, in a similar vein, trying to weave in stories between past and present, um, and it's not done as well, to be honest with you. So one of these interwoven stories centers around Stanley's ancestor, Elia, and his experience leading up to the point of his immigration from Latvia to the United States. So basically, Elia wants to marry this beautiful girl in his village, but he doesn't have a sufficient dowry. So he consults the local village medium mystic named Madame Zeroni, who instructs him to carry his small pig up the mountain every single day and sing it a song, in order for it to grow big and strong and him to grow big and strong so that he can get everything that he hoped for. After you give the pig to Menke, you must carry Madame Zeroni up the mountain and sing while I drink so I can get strong too. But she warns him that at the end of this, he needs to carry Madame Zeroni up the mountain, sing her the song, let her drink from the mountain stream. And if he fails to do so, then him and his future <laughs> families will be cursed for generations. If you forget to come back for Madame Zeroni, the only time that Stanley's family actually experiences a bit of good luck, it's kind of a mixed bag, and it's actually also bad luck. He was rocked by kissing Kate Ball. One of his ancestors was actually able to make some money in the stock market and start to build a life for himself until he runs into the famed outlaw kissing Kate Barlow, who steals his fortune. So he was lucky in the sense that he wasn't killed by Kiss and Kate, but unlucky in the sense that, oh, his family is just going right back to where they were before, being destitute. The other story that's woven into this tapestry centers around a school teacher named Catherine. Catherine taught at the one-room schoolhouse in the town of Green Lake, back when the lake was still a lake, and she developed a friendship and later relationship with a black man named Sam, who was an onion farmer. 
Onions, get your onions here, folks. God's own chosen vegetable. Nature's magic vegetables right here, folks. Now, despite being a black man, Sam was actually highly valued in the community because on top of selling his onions, he also used them to make various health tinctures that actually worked better than a lot of the things being offered by the actual physician in the town. Now, Catherine is also well known for her canned spiced peaches, and after seeing that there are some elements of the schoolhouse that need fixing, her and Sam come up with a trade so that Sam is going to be fixing parts of the schoolhouse that need fixing, and Kate will be paying him in peaches. That day, she was amazed to discover that when he was saying, I can fix that, what he meant was, I love you. And even more amazing was the day she realized she truly loved him back. Now, on top of teaching the children during the day, Catherine also has night classes where she teaches some of the adults in the community how to read. Some of them are there for the reading, but a couple of them are there because Catherine is pretty and they want her. Catherine is harassed by one of her adult students uh, for her to just give him a kiss, just give him a kiss. Um, and when she refuses, this leads to some lingering resentment. So when a couple days later, her and Sam are caught kissing, there is a lynch mob sent after him. Now, Catherine tries to stop this and goes to the sheriff to report all of it, uh, only to find out that, of course, the sheriff is in on it. So Sam actually isn't lynched, but he is shot um, as he's rowing back across the lake to his farm, trying to retreat. The next morning, Kate goes on down to the sheriff's office to confront her student who wanted a kiss and says, you know what? I changed my mind about that kiss. I'll give it to you. And then shoots him and then kisses him. Thus, we get one of the most incredible outlaw backstories of all time as our sweet school teacher, Catherine, who was in love with a black man becomes the famed outlaw kissing Kate Barlow who only kisses men that she kills after she kills them. I think just from that plot summary alone, you can already start to see what makes this book stand above the rest in terms of exploring complex ideas. Um, but I do want to go into some of the, those themes a bit deeper. And I think the obvious one to start with here is the prison industrial complex, because that's really the setting that we're dealing with in this story. He's in a juvie jail alternative. Now, speaking to the brevity alongside the complexity, I would actually like to read you chapter two, which is on page five and consists of less than a single page. In fact, really less than a half page. Quote, the reader is probably asking, why would anyone go to Camp Green Lake? Most campers weren't given a choice. Camp Green Lake is a camp for bad boys. If you take a bad boy and make him dig a hole every day in the hot sun, it will turn him into a good boy. That was what some people thought. Stanley Yelnance was given a choice. The judge said, you may go to jail or you may go to Camp Green Lake. Stanley was from a poor family. He had never been to camp before. Now, knowing that his mother is worried about him and also knowing that he doesn't really have anything positive to actually report from his experience at camp, the letters that he sends home are overwhelmingly positive. He's making up stories about learning to rock climb and swimming and all of these things that he very much is not doing. And on one of the letters that he gets back from his mother, she mentions that they're at risk of being evicted from their home. And even though Camp Green Lake is a relatively unconventional approach to the prison system, it still very much follows the pattern of state-sponsored violence against the kids within it. Despite the fact that they're very isolated from the outside world and the resources on the grounds are actually pretty limited even for the adults there as well, um, there is an overwhelming element of panopticism that the campers experience. On page 71, after meeting the warden for the first time, Stanley is speaking with some of the other campers and mentions that he wonders how the warden knew his name. 
and rather not just his actual legal name he re- she refers to all of the campers by their like given nicknames to each other so even though yes she would have known stanley's name stanley she didn't call him stanley she called him caveman so in a conversation after the fact i wonder how she knew all our names said stanley she watches us all the time said zigzag she's got hidden microphones and cameras all over the place in the tents the rec room the shower the shower asked stanley He wondered if Zigzag was just being paranoid. The cameras are tiny, said Armpit, no bigger than the toenail on your little toe. Stanley had doubts about that. He didn't think they could make cameras that small. Microphones, maybe. He realized that was why X-Ray didn't want to talk to him about the gold tube at breakfast. X-Ray was afraid the warden might have been listening. But just like many real people who are victims of the prison industrial complex today, Stanley was not actually guilty of the crime that he was being punished for. On page 7, he says he was innocent for the crime for which he was convicted. He'd just been in the wrong place at the wrong time. But despite being innocent, he understands that this label of guilty affects his day-to-day and the way that other people perceive him, the context under which he can communicate. So on page 17, when he's talking to one of the adult bullies at this camp named Mr. Pendansky, he says, I want you to know, Stanley, that I respect you. I understand you've made some bad mistakes in your life. Otherwise, you wouldn't be here. But everyone makes mistakes. You've done some bad things, but that doesn't mean you're a bad kid. Stanley nodded. It seemed pointless to try to tell his counselor that he was innocent. He figured that everyone probably said that. He didn't want Mr. Pendansky to think he had a bad attitude. But it's very much a damned if you do, damned if you don't situation, because just a few pages later, when the other campers are asking Stanley why he's there, and he owns up to the crime that he didn't commit, they don't believe him. Now, as Stanley lay on his cot, he thought it was kind of funny in a way. Nobody had believed him when he said he was innocent. Now, when he said that he had stolen them, nobody believed him either. And a couple pages after that, we learn a little bit more about his trial. So because the person that he stole from was technically a celebrity, because of this, we learn that Stanley wasn't able to nail down a public defender and his family was too poor to afford a lawyer. And he was therefore forced to represent himself in court. You don't need a lawyer, his mother said. Just tell the truth. Stanley told the truth, but perhaps it would have been better if he had lied a little. He could have said he found the shoes in the street. Nobody believed that they fell from the sky, which I guess is not a detail I told you. But again, I told you he didn't steal them, so they literally fell from the sky, and then he had them and then was caught with them. Now, we can't get much further into this without discussing Stanley's one friend, one true friend that he made during his time at camp, Zero. Now, Zero got his nickname because he is consistently underestimated by his peers and even the adults at the camp. Um, His name is because they say there's nothing knocking around in that brain of his. Basically, he's dumb and his brain is empty. We learn that this absolutely is not the case. Zero is incredibly smart, but he is illiterate because he didn't have access to resources such as a school. We learned that Zero was actually homeless and went long stretches of time without his mother around. It's kind of implied very, very subtly that his mother was a sex worker and would go missing for periods of time, presumably with clients. But it isn't revealed until later in the book that Zero is actually the person who did steal the shoes from the homeless shelter where he was accessing resources. And the fact that he was accessing those resources was actually out of the ordinary because he mentioned that he would avoid going to the shelters because he would get questioned about where his mom is. And if they found out that his mom was like actually missing, he would become a ward of the state, which he knew he didn't want to be. So even the resources that are there to help him are just another tool of state-sanctioned violence against him. So another theme that we see reoccurring pretty often is this idea of community care and kind of taking care of each other. I'll scratch your back if you scratch mine. Barter and trade comes up a lot throughout the story. We see this in a literal sense in Kate and Sam's story where they're trading onions and peaches and repair work. Um, But we also see it between Zero and Stanley. Zero manages to convince Stanley to trade him reading lessons, instruction, uh, for Zero helping Stanley 
dig his hole and therefore finish earlier so that they have more time for him to learn. Stanley is kind of the only person in this book who doesn't underestimate Zero, realizing very quickly just how smart he is. And in fact, he's a whiz in math skills. When Stanley is talking about Zero needing to learn the different letters and then realizes that there's uppercase and lowercase letters, Zero immediately knows, oh, so there's 52 I need to learn, not 26. And Stanley's, or yeah, Stanley's like, how did you even know that? Like, how did you do? And Hector or Zero, I keep calling him Hector because I know his name. Zero, <laughs> Zero, uh, Zero is like, I don't know, it just is. And we see that come up more often. Zero, just math, he gets. Direction, he gets. He just doesn't know how to read. That doesn't mean he's not incredibly smart. I think the overarching theme that can be found throughout every little piece of this story is this idea of fate, destiny, choices, and breaking cycles. Throughout the entire book, Stanley refers to his situation in these terms. He's thinking about it through the lens of luck and curses. His family has bad luck. They've been cursed. In fact, when so Stanley's father is like trying to find, he's an inventor and he's trying to invent a remedy for stinky shoes, okay? Honey, would you smell the shoe? And when the shoes fall on Stanley, he refers to it as destiny. Stanley couldn't help but think that there was something special about the shoes, that they were somehow provide the key to his father's invention. It was too much of a coincidence to be a mere accident. Stanley felt like he was holding destiny's shoes. And this isn't something new that Stanley is coming up with independently, it's the framing that his ancestors have been thinking of their lives for generations. After moving to America and forgetting to bring Madame Zeroni up the mountain, Elias uh, talks about how their life was not easy. Elia worked hard, but bad luck seemed to follow him everywhere. He always seemed to be at the wrong place, at the in the wrong place at the wrong time. You and your family will be cursed for always and eternity. Stanley's father, said all of them had something else in common. Despite their awful luck, they always remained hopeful. As Stanley's father liked to say, I learn from failure. This book is so well woven that I'm really struggling to like give you guys all of the context necessary for every little thing that I'm talking about because I'm like, oh, I need to explain this. So after Stanley's ancestor was robbed but not killed by kissing Kate in the desert in the area that would become Camp Green Lake, um, he was found like a few weeks later seemingly incoherent and the he, he claimed that the only reason he survived is because of God's thumb. Nobody really knows what that meant. And also, he was so mad from, like, dehydration and all of that stuff that he also didn't really know what he meant by it. <laughs> After an altercation, uh, Zero ends up running away and off into the desert. And after a day or so, Stanley ends up following him, hoping he can bring him back and that he hasn't died out in the desert. But when he goes after him, he ends up finding the overturned boat of Sam where Zero has been hiding underneath in the shade, almost dead. When he joins Zero underneath, uh, turns out Zero has been eating what he has lovingly referred to as sploosh, but is actually um, some of <laughs> Kate's canned peaches from over a hundred years ago that uh, luckily didn't give them botulism. Stanley tries to convince Zero to come back with him to Camp Green Lake, but Zero is not budging. He's not going to do that. So, desperately looking for other options, Stanley scans his surroundings and sees something a little peculiar. Is that not right there? That one? Yeah. Huh. Does that look like you? we learn that Zero is not only his nickname that he got um, from not having anything in his brain, it's also a play on his last name, which happens to be Zeroni, as in Madame Zeroni. What they end up finding at the top of God's Thumb is a relatively, at least for the desert, wet landscape with mud that they are able to dig water out of, and also onions that they promptly eat. 
And as they're falling asleep and getting some rest, uh, Stanley decides to sing the lullaby that has been in his family for so long, which is the wolf song that Elia was instructed to sing to the pig at the top of the mountain. And the next day, Zero mentions that, actually, I know that song. My family sang it too. So again, Stanley has fully broken this curse by fulfilling the promise that his great-great-grandfather had made to Madame Zeroni. You must carry Madame Zeroni up the mountain and sing while I drink so I can get strong too. So throughout the story, onions are consistently healing and life-giving. When we first encounter uh, Sam's onions, in the flashback to uh, Kate and Sam's story, again, he's well known for the onion tinctures that work better than the doctor's cures. The ancient Egyptians knew the secrets of the onions. High as potent juices can cure stomach aches and toothaches, measles and mumps, rheumatism, hemorrhoids. <laughs> if you don't believe me, just ask Mary Lou. All she eats is onions and she's almost 100 years old. Also, when they reach the top of this mountain, it is life-giving. It is... Th the onions at the top of God's thumb are what saves both Stanley's however great-grandfather and also Stanley and Zero. Meanwhile, the peaches are sweet and pure and persevering, almost as if Sam and Kate's love has survived in a tangible way. And not only does this love survive, it's what actually sustains the two of them on their journey. So after putting all of the pieces together and thinking back to where he actually found the lipstick tube of kissing Kate Barlow, he realized that there's a good chance that his family's treasure is around the spot where he dug the hole and found the lipstick tube in the first place. So him and Zero decide to go back and dig one final hole, hoping to find his family's missing fortune. Now, the fact that they've been eating onions for the past week is actually of huge benefit to them because they're, oh gosh, there's so much that I, ugh, I didn't explain the lizards. <laughs> there's also this, uh, there are these yellow spotted lizards that don't actually exist in real life, but like everybody is afraid of them, including the warden. It's the only thing that strikes fear into everybody because they represent death and they're kind of inescapable. But turns out the only thing that keeps them away from people, that makes them not interested, is onions. They don't like the scent or the taste. So the fact that these two boys have been eating them for a week means that they're not appetizing to these lizards. So when Zero and uh, Stanley are actually discovered searching for the treasure by the warden, Mr. Sir, but realizes that they're covered in these lizards, the warden is basically like, well, let's just wait them out. There's no way they're going to survive that. Except they do because of the onions, reaffirming that the onions represent this life-giving energy. Now, the lizards themselves are representative of danger and death in the harsh landscape. It's explained that they didn't actually exist in the area until after the lake had dried up after Sam was killed. Part of the Basically, killing Sam put a curse on the landscape as well, meaning that there hasn't been any rain in the area for over a hundred years. That's why the lake has completely dried up. After many years of being kissing Kate Barlow, she finds herself back in the lake bed, continuing to mourn the loss of Sam. But while she's there, she's confronted by one of her students that she rejected many years before with uh, his wife, who was also one of her child students. And he, they basically try to threaten her <laughs> to tell them where she buried the treasure because they know that it's somewhere in the vicinity. The woman came to her. Where is it? She demanded. Linda Miller, asked Kate. Is that you? Linda Miller had been in the fourth grade when Kate Barlow was still a teacher. She had been a cute, freckle-faced girl with beautiful red hair. Now her face was blotchy and her hair was dirty and scraggly. It's Linda Walker now, said Trout. Oh, Linda, I'm so sorry, said Kate. Trout jabbed her throat with the rifle. Where's the loot? There is no loot, said Kate. Don't give me that, shouted Trout. You've robbed every bank from here to, to Houston. You better tell him, said Linda. We're desperate. You married him for his money, didn't you, asked Kate. Linda nodded. But it's all gone. It dried up with the lake. The peach trees, the livestock. I kept thinking, it has to rain soon. The drought can't last forever, but it just keeps getting hotter and hotter and hotter. 
her eyes fixated on the shovel, which was leaning up against the fireplace. She's buried it, she declared. I don't know what you're talking about, said Kate. There was a loud blast as Trout fired his rifle just above her head. The window behind her shattered. Where is it buried, he demanded. Go ahead and kill me, Trout, said Kate. But I sure hope you like to dig, because you're going to be digging for a long time. It's a big, vast wasteland out there. You and your children and their children can dig for the next hundred years, and you'll never find it. The lizard landed on Kate's bare ankle. Its sharp black teeth bit into her leg. Its white tongue lapped up the droplets of blood that leaked out of the wound. Kate smiled. There was nothing they could do to her, to her anymore. Start digging, she said. Where is it? Linda screeched. Where'd you bury it? Trout demanded. Kate Barlow died laughing. Kate doesn't fear death because, frankly, life has nothing left for her to offer. And I think it's really fitting. Her whole persona has been built upon uh, the idea that she is the literal kiss of death. It's not something she fears, it's something she, frankly, was ready for. When the shoes first fell on him, Stanley felt like it was destiny, like it was going to be the answer to solving all of his family's problems. In fact, he even says that it felt like he was holding destiny's shoes. Of course, when he ends up going through everything that he goes through, this feels less so like destiny and more like bad luck. But towards the end of the book, he actually reverts back to his original idea that it had been destiny all along, and it was instead the chance for him to break the cycle. As Stanley stared at the glittering night sky, he thought there was no place he would rather be. He was glad Zero put the shoes on the parked car. He was glad they fell from the overpass and hit him on the head. When the shoes first fell from the sky, he remembered thinking that destiny had struck him. Now, he thought so again. It was more than coincidence. It had to be destiny. So, while there is this ongoing theme of the actions happening within the story being fate and destiny, there is an element of choice within that framework. So, even though you know they've kind of been cursed this whole time, there was never going to be a good answer, it they continued to try. They continued to, to do their best to break out of this cycle of bad luck. And I think it's a really good metaphor for the ways that, yes, you can do the best with your circumstances and you can take hold of some elements of it, but ultimately we are all still, still operating within a larger framework of society, of capitalism, that we can't break free from. And our choices are not always going to be able to overcome those. We cannot, on an individual scale, conquer the things that are looking to oppress us, the things that are keeping us down, the cycles that we are stuck in. Of course, Stanley and his family do get a good ending. He's able to find the treasure. Um, him and Zero, Zero is able to find his mom. Like, it's a good ending, but ultimately, like, Breaking out of that cycle wasn't something that Stanley chose to do. It's something that he was, he had the opportunity to do. It was, he couldn't just choose to get out of it. It was, he was presented with the, the way out. So the other motif, uh, probably the most obvious one, is of course digging. But beyond just digging the holes for you know, character building. Um, there's also a lot of metaphor to go into the idea of digging deep within you, as well as uh, digging your grave. I think this is another good point of, you know, the story trusting its child audience to be able to grapple with these things, where as they're working their way up the mountain, it says, Zero knelt, bent over with his head on the ground. Stanley could hear a very low moaning sound coming from him. He looked at the shovel and couldn't help but think that he might need to dig a grave. Zero's last hole. And who will dig a grave for me, he thought. It's important to note that this story is not all doom and gloom. It's actually quite delightful and funny in, in certain parts because... It's not because we're trying to bring humor to the situation. It's because kids are in it and kids are funny. Stanley is a very sensitive kid who's able to see the humor in a lot of situations and that comes out within his narrative. And I think that's really evident in one part where he's chatting with one of his fellow campers, X-Ray, and they're talking about his name. So, you're new here, right? Said X-Ray. I've been here for almost a year. I've never found anything. You know, my eyesight's not so good. No one knows this, but you know why, why my name's X-Ray? 
Stanley shrugged one shoulder. It's pig Latin for Rex. That's all. I'm too blind to find anything. And Stanley can see the humor in that. So while they're in one of the holes uh, with Stanley's treasure, basically waiting for the lizards to kill them, we also learned that the warden is another person intergenerationally linked within the story. I'm tired of this, Grandpa! That's too damn bad! And just like the others in her family, her life has been taken over by this obsession uh, to find the treasure. The warden is not like a, a good character or a positive person within the book, but you do have to feel a little bit bad for her when this thing that her whole life has been wasted looking for is finally right in front of her and she doesn't even get the satisfaction of touching it. It's not that I wanted her to have the treasure or that she deserves even a single piece of it, but you do have to feel a little bit bad because her life has been ruined by the cycles built by her ancestors just like Stanley and Zeros have. Now, let's talk about the movie, because I honestly think that this is one of the best book-to-screen adaptations I've ever seen. It is basically a line-by-line -line retelling of the book, and I think that's actually a testament, again, to one of the aspects that I think makes good children's literature, is being able to explore these themes in as few words as possible. The fact that the movie touches on literally every single detail from the books, um, and it still fits within the two-hour runtime, is a great example of Louis Sekar really choosing his words intentionally. Like, there is not a single piece from this book that isn't necessary. It's also helpful that the author also wrote the screenplay. Normally, that's not a good thing. Normally, that, it, that kind of situation turns into something really bad because of the fact that authors tend to want every single detail represented. They're writing for a different medium that they don't have experience with. But in this case, it actually really worked because of the fact that every single detail is necessary. So Louis Sekar just basically added to his book. We get a few additional scenes exploring things that Stanley isn't personally witnessing. So like we get to see a couple uh, scenes with his family. By the way, fantastic cast. His dad is played by uh, Henry Winkler, which is hilarious. Their scenes are so funny. Oh my God, honey, can't you just wait till I'm finished eating? I know I've asked you a million times, just a million and one more. Smell the shoe. Honey, I don't smell anything. What? I don't smell anything. Uh -huh. Huh? What do you smell? Nothing. Peaches and onions. That's the secret. I don't smell anything. You don't smell anything. I don't smell anything. Whoa, I don't smell anything. We don't, don't smell, don't smell anything. anything. I told you I was on the brink of no stink. I don't smell anything. I don't smell, I don't smell anything. anything. I don't smell anything. I don't smell anything. But how effectively the entire story fits within a two-hour runtime is really just a testament to the efficiency of the storytelling. He explores so many themes, but he does it so succinctly. Also, the movie just straight up had a really great cast. Okay, we have Henry Winkler as uh, Stanley's father. We have Shia LaBeouf as Stanley. We have Sigourney Weaver as a warden. I think we got something. We got something nice. We got something nice. Right over there. Mr. Pendanski is played by a famous guy, too. I can't think of his name. I've literally met him, and I can't think of his name. He was also in, like, uh, The Ballad of Buster Scruggs and many other things. I've, hold on, I gotta look up his name. <laughs> Tim Blake Nelson, that's his name. So after all of that, let's zoom back out a little bit and talk about our big takeaways. One of my favorite things about this book is the fact that the author himself doesn't really prescribe a big moral takeaway that you're supposed to get out of reading the book, that everybody is supposed to walk away understanding. Instead, he presents an array of real-life problems and allows them to be as complex and nuanced as they are when you're living them. You don't walk away Away from the story feeling like there was one thing you were supposed to learn, you walk away from it pondering a myriad of questions.
I think the closest thing there is to one big takeaway that you should have from reading it is simply the emphasis on the importance of choices while also acknowledging that there are many things out of a person's control and we are existing within the systems that keep us captive. That doesn't mean we completely lose our agency, but life is nuanced and we're not always going to get what we want or what we work for or what we deserve. At the end of the day, stories like these are needed, not just for the children who get to read them, but also for the adults who create them. Many of the most beloved children's authors and children's books were written by people who did not have children on their own, maybe didn't even particularly like children, <laughs> but they understood children often because they've worked so hard to reflect on their own childhood and understand themselves. You know, we talk so much nowadays about our need to heal our inner child, and I truly think that a lot of the great children's literature was that practice for the author who wrote it. You know, going back again to the late, great Mr. Rogers, his whole ministry, everything that he did, ultimately comes back to the fact that he wanted that for other children because it wasn't something that he experienced himself. He had a really tough childhood. And he used Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood to explore some of those things, to, to go back and find healing for himself as well as helping future generations. You know, Daniel Striped Tiger is a representation of his own inner child. The use of puppets was a way for him to be a little bit separated from his own experience, but explore it through a new lens. And I think the same could be said for many authors. It's a lot easier, even as an adult, for me to have Daniel say, I'm really scared. Do you think maybe you could give me a hug? You know, that would be hard for me to say, I'm really scared. Do you think you could give me a hug? So the difference from, the, from here to here, that doesn't seem very far but it was efficacious. I think it's really important moving forward to acknowledge that children are people. And I know that sounds so simple, but they are. And it's so easy for others to forget that. Um, don't get me wrong. I personally don't really want children, but that doesn't mean I don't like kids. That doesn't mean I don't see them as valuable members of society. And I think it's so important that we take them seriously, that we give them opportunities to take themselves seriously. Once again, referencing Bruce Handy, he said, I think the same could be said of nearly all writers and illustrators I've discussed. Their books happened not because of commercial calculation or literary ambition, but because these books were needed by the creators themselves, which is true of any worthwhile art. And I think Bruce really sums up my feelings in the final paragraph of his story as he's talking about reading to his children as they got a little bit older. I wish I could remember the specific title Isaac and I were reading. I think it was one of Beverly Cleary's. Halfway through the chapter, I heard slow, deep, gentle breaths coming from the upper bunk. Me, I was disappointed. I wanted to know what happened in the next book. I could have gotten up, but is there any sound more enchanting than that of a sleeping child? So I stayed put in the rocking chair. I kept reading. I encourage us all to keep reading, not just books made for adults, but books made for everybody of all ages, in all genres. There's so much to be gained from reading anything, reading anything at all, that I really encourage you to go out of your comfort zone, or maybe go back and revisit some of your favorite books that you had as a child, especially if you're in a reading slump or something like that. These are books that are meant for children to be able to finish and feel accomplished finishing. Truly, I think children's books uh, are great for getting you out of reading slumps. But revisiting some of your favorite titles as a child, you might just walk away with a new perspective, something that you didn't get to see the first time around. And I would like to leave you all to ponder the wise words of E.B. White, The End of Charlotte's Web. Life in the barn was very good. Night and day, winter and summer, spring and fall, dull days and bright days. It was the best place to be, thought Wilbur, this warm, delicious cellar, with the garrulous geese, the changing seasons, the heat of the sun, the passage of swallows, the nearness of rats, the sameness of sheep, the love of spiders, the smell of manure, and the glory of everything. 
I hope you find glory in everything. Thank you so much for sitting through what I imagine is going to be a very long video once I start editing this. But again, my name is Dove. Um, I hope you go ahead and give me a like or a subscribe. I am still new to YouTube. This is my second video ever, so I really hope you enjoyed yourself. If there are any books that speak to you in a way that Holes really speaks to me, I would love to hear about them. Um, so please let me know in the comments below. Is there anything I missed too? Is there something spectacular about Holes that I didn't touch on? I would love to hear that as well. Thank you so much for being here. Remember that we should all be eating the rich and I hope to see you again soon. Bye.